A man out on bond accused of causing a crash that led to devastating injuries for a teenager learns his fate in a courtroom and a lawsuit has been filed against all of the alleged players involved, including the city of St. Louis. We're breaking down the case of Daniel Riley with Dan Morgan, managing partner for powerhouse law firm Morgan & Morgan. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Janae Edmondson was just 17 years old, an active high school volleyball player, getting ready for big events like prom, graduation, the rest of her life, when disaster struck. The Tennessee teen was at a volleyball tournament with her parents in St. Louis, Missouri in February 2023. Family was walking back to their hotel when two cars crashed, colliding into Janae. And as a result, both of her legs had to be amputated. Janae testified during the trial of Daniel Riley, the man accused of driving the car that caused that crash. We were about to proceed, and then after that, I was I grabbed my dad and I said, "Oh, watch out!" And we turned and ran. And then after that, I felt something hit me, and it was warm. And then after that, I ended up on my stomach, face down, and I was screaming because I couldn't feel my body. And I was just in pain. Okay. And I was screaming because I, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what. 22-year-old Daniel Riley was charged with one count each of second-degree assault and armed criminal action, which are both felonies. He was also charged with multiple misdemeanors, including driving without a license. Police say Riley blew past a yield sign, causing another car to hit his and sending both vehicles flying. Reports say he had accelerated from 17 miles per hour to 45 miles per hour within 3.5 seconds and then floored the car before crashing. A toxicologist had testified that Riley's blood tested positive for THC, fentanyl, and codeine. At the time of the crash, Riley was out on bond after he was suspected of being part of an armed robbery, and it turns out that Riley had violated his bond close to 90 times since he was originally charged in 2020. According to court documents, the armed robbery case had yet to go to trial because, quote, the state wasn't ready. And despite these multiple violations, Riley was allowed to stay on house arrest. He wasn't locked up. So far, Janae has had to have almost 30 surgeries to deal not only with the amputations, but also injuries to her inter internal organs and pelvis. It's absolutely horrible. It took a jury. Just about three hours to find Riley guilty of four of the five charges. The jury actually recommended that he spend almost 19 years in prison, but an actual sentencing won't take place until April when a judge will decide if Riley's sentences will run consecutively or concurrently. Now, Janae has also filed a massive lawsuit against multiple defendants, including against the city of St. Louis. We're going to talk about it. So to discuss this, let me bring in personal injury attorney Dan Morgan, the managing partner of Morgan & Morgan, our proud sponsor here on Sidebar, a powerhouse law firm. Dan, so good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Good to see you, too. Thanks for having me. So, Dan, this is a horrific, horrific case, um, and it breaks my heart every time I see Janae you know, in a wheelchair um, because she was an athlete. She, she really had so much to look forward to, and this devastated her life and really— an unthinkable way. But before we even get into the lawsuit, do you think the judge will agree with the jury on 19 years in prison? In other words, running the sentences consecutively, one after the other, and not together, meaning concurrently? Because my understanding is the judge, under Missouri law, the judge can reduce the punishment of the jury if he finds it excessive. And to be clear with what the jury recommended, the jury recommended that Riley serve six years and three months for second degree assault, 11 years and eight months for armed criminal action, 10 months for fourth degree assault, plus a 10 month fourth degree assault charge that actually has to be served in the city justice center. So the rest of the sentence will be served in prison. But do you think the judge is going to agree that 19 years is the appropriate punishment here? I, in my personal opinion, I, I do. I think the judge is going to lay down what the jury re recommended. I don't see him going more heavy-handed. Could he potentially add? But I really don't see him saying, hey, we'll just 
do him running consecutively, given this guy's background, his criminal history. Um, you know, look, 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 looking at the lawsuit that was filed that he violated his bail, you know, 40 times. This isn't, you know, he made a mistake uh, and he slipped up, you know, one time. This is a repeated offender. And judges always look, take that into account when, when making a, a, a sentencing. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he follows the jury's recommendations, but we'll see. Um, has some discretion there. Let's talk about the lawsuit. This is your bread and butter now. because So Janae's filed a lawsuit, and I'm going to go through the different defendants and what you think of the claims. One of the defendants listed in this lawsuit, as I mentioned, is the city of St. Louis. The suit is blaming the city, saying there should have been a stop sign, not a yield sign, at that intersection because the buildings prevent drivers from being able to see each other or see the other cars. The suit states, quote, St. Louis owed a duty to the general public and specifically to pedestrians like Janae Edmondson to remove or warn of dangerous conditions and to maintain the intersection, including the area surrounding the intersection, in a reasonably safe condition. In violation of this duty, St. Louis negligently permitted and maintained a dangerous condition to exist at the intersection, creating an unreasonable risk of injury to pedestrians. What do you make of that argument? It is a premises liability argument. I mean, I see where they're going with it, and it does make sense. I mean, you'd have to take the history of that intersection, though. I mean, if this was the one and only time this accident happened, I don't think they have a very strong argument. But if you took a historical data collection, which is obviously the public record, and you saw, hey, at this exact yield intersection, there's five accidents a month or there's been over 20 in the past five years and you show a history or repeated um, action by the city to not take action to make changes when they see that damage and, and, and injuries are happening at the specific place um, that, yeah, that could be a viable claim. So it really comes into the discovery phase of it and really seeing was this a one off event that happened right here at this yield? I understand they're saying, well, the buildings and blocking, you can get code, code enforcements and, and agencies out there that do that. My guess is that they went through all that proper screening once they first got approval. But if there was in a repeated history of these accidents, then there could be a need for the public to have a, a, a change in course of what's going on there. Generally speaking, though, have you ever seen a lawsuit based on the city not having the right signage or having the wrong kind of stoplight or having something to do with traffic that was the city's fault? Have you ever seen a lawsuit like that? Uh, we have, actually. Yeah. I mean, there's times, too, when they don't do the proper, you know, it could be one-off events we have here in Orlando sometimes. I know per personally when the they rerouted the traffic wrong, kind of had it set up to cause an accident. Um, it was foreseeable and an accident did, did, did occur. And an injury did result from, from, from that accident. So yeah, it, it definitely has happened. It's not like this is a new theory to go after the cities for these things. And again, like I said, if there is a, like a repeated history, um, same with the sidewalk. Right. You know, this sidewalk, there's a, there's a step off um, mm -hmm. and it's not properly co contrasted and there's been 20 falls at that same spot on the city sidewalk and they just leave it like that and not paint this side yellow and this side white. Well, then you can bring a claim saying, hey, you guys knew this was going to happen. You didn't change the course. Accidents keep happening. People keep falling and busting their teeth open and nothing's been done. No, no, nothing's changed. Then you can go out for the city for not uh, right, for not rectifying the situation. What about this fact? I saw this in local reporting that the yield sign was replaced with a stop sign after this happened. So if that's the case, does that show that the city knew they were in the wrong. Yeah, this is like a, a classic law school uh, question dictionary. Uh, it's a re remedial measure. Um, so most most time, almost all the time, you can't take a change that someone did to make a condition safer to then say, hey, it wasn't done right in the first place then. Um, so it does show that the city has now said, hey, this a change need, needs to happen. We are going to make it safer. Um, but you can't take that evidence and then show, okay. hey, could have, should have, would have type, type, type of deal. So yeah, that's kind of okay. a... So in other words, exactly. you can correct the problem doesn't mean that you were legally responsible. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Exactly. They don't want because they don't want people to then not fix problems if they're in a lawsuit where hey, right. you could you know because if I do fix it, then I'm saying I'm guilty, but I don't think I'm guilty. But uh, there's a chance that I could solve a future injury for this to happen again because um, it is foreseeable too. So if you now you didn't think it could happen, but now you know it happened, well then you should go ahead and change it. See why we have you as our uh, personal injury uh, expert right now. All right, so let's talk about. Um, the fact that Janae has not only sued the city, she sued Mr. Riley for negligence, but also sued his mom, Kimberly Riley, for negligent entrustment. The argument was you shouldn't have let him drive this rented car, this rented Audi, 
when you knew he was on house arrest, when you knew he didn't have a driver's license, the suit actually says he was incompetent. What do you make of that argument? Um, I think these are her, these are these lawyers and her families and her case's strongest claims are going against the at fault driver and the negligent in, in, entrustment, potentially the rental car if they have an insurance agreement too, if they knew he was going to drive and they then allow him, you know, there's different scopes and I want to um, forecast, but th those are kind of in the cleanest one in Missouri and in St. Louis, they have sovereign immunity. So bringing uh, cases against cities and states and government entities is already a, a hurdle in itself. So these routes will definitely be a lot cleaner route to justice. Um, and it's actually going after the person that caused the harm. Her issue is going to be, you know, what does what does this individual have to, re to really go after? You know, if you sue him, and you, obviously she's, in my opinion, no no money is re really enough money for her for what she's gone through and what and what she has to deal with for the rest of her life. But that person most likely doesn't have that type of money to pay what those damages are. Um, so you know, you're kind of in a really tough sit situation there. But you no, know, there is definitely a claim of negligent entrustment if if that mother gave her son a car that she knew he you know he didn't have a license and she said here you know run run to the store and go give me something he's just as guilty as he is for giving him those keys well you mentioned the car rental company the car rental company is also being sued for as well negligent entrustment i, I don't know exactly at this point if they knew um you know when when his mom was renting the car that they knew he would drive it as well or is it the idea if we are entrusting this car to you, um, we are also assuming responsibility for anybody that you give it to. I don't know how that works because if in terms – again, I don't know what the rental paperwork was, but if someone rents a car and then that person gives the car to their son, their friend to drive, is it the, is it the car rental company that's on the hook or is it the, the, like the mom of that person on the hook? Yeah, so usually the, the rental car companies have pretty ironclad contracts that, hey, if you, you know, if another person is going to be driving, who is that person? What's their, I, you know, their driver, there's been times when I've been with my parents, you know, and I didn't have my driver's license on me. So the, the driver's comp, the rental car company said, you know, you're not allowed to drive the car then. If I was to then they would say, hey, we know you're still going to drive it. Don't worry about giving us this information. Now I'll document it. Then, yeah, there could be a right a realm to tie that thing back end of the negligent entrustment. Most likely in this case, it's gonna be a little more tough to connect those dots uh, for them. Again, I think this is a tip, you, you, you wanna overplay, you wanna name everybody that could have some liability um, and, and some Im implications here. And there's probably also most, most rental car companies too do have an underlying insurance um, package, you know, that's out there. Most likely right. this, this rental car company has probably pitched those limits, whatever that is. Um, you know, but definitely I would say the cleaner route is definitely against the mom. Um, if she did throw those keys to him on that day and say, you know, take take the car, knowing what she knew. Obviously, the insur the rental company would be in trouble, I would imagine, if they knew about that he was going to drive or he signed paperwork exactly. that he was going to drive. Um, the other driver was also part of this lawsuit. She's also being sued, Elizabeth Smith. Um, so she's one of the named defendants. Uh, Riley's car was struck by Smith's car when he sped into the intersection. Now, Janae says that Smith was negligent and careless in operating the car, wasn't paying attention think that that's a good argument against smith smith uh again if she had an opportunity if smith had an opportunity to avoid the collision uh you know there could be comparative li liability so even though um riley's 90 percent at fault for this accident a jury could say hey there's 10 percent on smith for for this accident so whatever that verdict is say and i'm just gonna use round round numbers to make it easy for the listeners but say yeah. it's you know a million dollars then you know smith would be as responsible for that hundred thousand dollar chunk and, and the Rileys would be responsible for that $900,000 chunk. So um, I think in this situation, if a jury does come in and say, hey, this, uh, and again, I don't know the facts about what Smith was doing, but if she was texting or speeding or switching lanes and had an opportunity to avoid the accident and didn't, well, then a jury could come and put comparative li liability on her as well. Um, so I think it's another case where you want to make sure you overplead that way you don't come down and uh, get get a verdict, and a jury does put something on Smith, but you didn't name her in the in the complaint, so now you're not getting anything from him. So it's definitely, I think, a smart uh, move by the attorney here to make sure that everybody that uh, could have some comparative li liability on this verdict is attached. Hey, so we want to thank Morgan and Morgan for sponsoring today's Law and Crime YouTube Takeover. If you've seen our videos, you know Morgan and Morgan is a very proud sponsor of ours. Look. I think it's clear to see from our content that the world is not always the safest place, right? And if you get hurt, that can be so confusing. That could be so scary. What do you do? Who do you turn to? Well, 
Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm, can help you. See, if you're injured, you need to know your legal rights. You need to know whether you could be compensated for your injury. At Morgan & Morgan, they have made it super easy for their clients because they've completely modernized the process. You submit your claim and you talk to your whole legal team all from your smartphone. Seeing if you have a case only takes a few minutes. And Morgan & Morgan, they're all about fighting for the compensation you deserve. They don't settle for lowball insurance offers. In fact, they've recently secured verdicts of $12 million in Florida, $6.8 million in New York, and $26 million in Philadelphia. All of these, by the way, were significantly higher than the highest insurance offers. So if you're injured, you can start by easily submitting a claim at forthepeople.com slash YouTube takeover or by dialing pound law that's pound 529 on your phone so all said and done I've me- I mentioned the claims I've mentioned the defendants assuming that the city is on the hook assuming the uh, rental car companies on the hook the different defendants are on the hook what kind of damages could Janae be looking at here well, I mean, it's it's really, I mean, you, you've got all the medical damages that she's gone through. I think, I mean, I was reading earlier, so I believe it's north of 20 surgeries and, and, and more in the future and, you know, all that that she's already gone through and all that's going to be needed into the future. So those are just the economical damages. That's just saying, hey, these are real numbers that she's incurred that she's had to pay for medical surgery. So that's one bucket. So whatever that number is, I think a jury is going to have no problem writing down. It, I mean, that's just basic. Here's, here, here, here's the numbers. Here's what the doctors present. Um, I think it'd be tough for any uh, defense attorney to say anything that resulted from that was not due to what transpired that day. So I think the economical damage will speak for themselves. Um, and, you know, Lord willing, she has all the insurance and everything she needs, the medical coverages now that have been taking care of all that. So hopefully those are outstanding for her. But the, um, the civil system is there to make sure that she is made whole on that. Then you get into the non-economicals, and that's where it's really... Um, left up to a jury. What is all that pain and suffering worth? The inconvenience for the rest of her life, the pain and suffering that she's gone through and the pain and suffering that she has to endure in the future. Um, you know, you're talking about a girl that was a volleyball player that had, you know, college and everything, her whole life ahead of her and all of that's now. Um, she'll be bound to a wheelchair, W amputated. Um, you know, it's just, it's, 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 un- it's unfathomable. So, you know, when, when you really think about what is that worth, what is, you know, it, it's really in my mind, you know, we would be asking for a number well into the nine figures, you know, not 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 the eight figures. This would be a hundred million dollar type ask to a jury plus just because of thinking about all this girl's yeah. had to gone through all, all all she will go through, what her family then has to, you know, it's just it's really unfathomable. So yeah, th- this would be um and, but again, the problem with no matter what that number is, say it's a hundred million dollars. Where's that money going to come from if the state has the sovereign immunity so they, they have li- limits on what can be collected? If the Rileys don't have, obviously, the, the you know, I haven't seen their names in the Forbes list or anything like that, so they're most likely not going to have the funds to pay that down. So it's really going to be a situation of who has um, to, to be collected. But, yeah, definitely a verdict if it went to a jury would be astronomical. Or a potential settlement if these uh, defendants are yeah. still on the hook and it's making its way through trial and uh, it's getting yeah. messy. Um, listen, this we know this lawsuit has actually been delayed to March 2025, so we'll wait and see what happens between now and then. Um, just a really, really sad case, and I will say um, from all of us, you know, we're just sending our best wishes to Janae and her family because it's really a heartbreaking sure. situation. Dan Morgan, thank you so much for coming on, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, that's all we have for you here on this episode of Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.